Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight where we fight tooth and nail, sometimes tongue in cheek, over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon, the Ruckheads join me shortly. Our topics this week, a ballot conclusion, a pre-K preclusion, and one columnist, confusion, plus roast and toast. Well, we're going to start with our interview segment and take a look at K-12 education in Kansas. Typically, we talk about school finance and the battles between the Supreme Court and the legislature. But this week, we look at day-to-day -day operations and the fundamentals of providing a quality education. And joining me for that is Dr. Randy Watson, the Kansas Commissioner of Education. Dr. Watson, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks, Mike. Thank you Pleasure very much. to be for... here, and I'm glad that we're talking about the fundamentals of education and not funding <laughs> and Not today. school finance. <laughs> so uh, thank you. I, I'm equally glad because <laughs> we have talked about it a great deal on this program. First of all, if you would, give us a basic overview of the Department of Education, what it is and what it does. The Department of Education oversees the distribution of state uh, of funding of education and then the oversight of accreditation, uh, the licensure of teachers, and the standards by which uh, uh, curriculum is developed from. Uh, the, st the elected state board of education, so that the department is the working agency that works for the state board of education. That's a 10 member elected board and they have general oversight given by the Kansas Constitution to them to oversee uh, all matters of education except funding. Yeah. Which is a legislative matter. Uh, or a Supreme Court matter, depending y on yes. how you look at yes. it. Uh, so elected officials essentially set the policies and you make certain those policies are implemented that as is best correct. as possible. That is correct. Okay, you've been involved in something that does sound quite interesting and intriguing. It's called the Kansas Can School Redesign Program. Are you redesigning education in Kansas? We are. You know, Mike, we've only in Kansas, and this is true for most states, two models of education in, uh, since we were a territory in Kansas. So if, when you think about that, there was the one-room schoolhouse, those were on every section of land, uh, small, grades one through eight, one teacher, uh, very much a, a community-based school. When we closed those, tens of thousands of those in Kansas uh, in the, at the turn of the century, 1900s, we started to slowly close those in the 1920s and really finished that in the 1980s. We moved kids to town and uh, we created a second system. And that second system was created based upon age. So a, a nine-year-old, for example, would go to third grade uh, and they would study a specific content and they would do so for a specific period of time. I say the most common uh, when you think about school, freshmen would go to a class called freshman English and the most common length of time in a Kansas school, they would study for 52 minutes a day. So that age, time, content-based system is one that most of us grew up in and lived in, and uh, we question that uh, that system as it relates to the needs of kids and the economy of Kansas And today. you're trying to make the training more individualized? Yes, we're actually trying to look at every, every student and every family and then trying to personalize that experience in school uh, for that student and that family. Well, backing up to what you said before, I think I read in some of the literature about your department that we're educating children today like we did a hundred years ago, a yes, century ago. Th that's correct. And yet everything about uh, the, the rest of the world has changed dramatically. You know, we like to say for most of the 19th uh, and, and, or the, and the 20th century, information was really expensive. You had to go to someone who was an expert or to a library, or maybe you were you're fortunate enough that your family could afford a uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica or a world book. But, but information was expensive. Experience was inexpensive because you worked on a farm and you had multiple jobs. Today, information is cheap. We all have smartphones. Right, right here. Right there. That's all you need. Uh, smartphones, you can find it at your disposal, but experience is expensive. And so we're trying to change that model now to look at every student and family and get broader experiences. A couple of quick questions. Uh, where does Kansas rank in national assessments of schools? Well, that depends on what you look at. So if you if you look at what the well, Kansas graduation Association rates, is, well, we're in the uh, top 10. Right? Uh, we're at 87 right now. Uh, so we're in the top 10 in, in the country. 
Uh, we're trying to raise that to 95. We want to lead the world. Uh, and we're really looking at post-secondary success, so going on after high school to a technical school or a four-year. Uh, and I think when Kansas Association of School Boards looked, we were in the, uh, of all measures, we were in the top 15 when they combined like test scores and, and graduation rates and all, almost all the measures and looked across all states. Do that without any money. Well, <laughs> no, I'm you know, kidding. redesign uh, isn't really about money. It's about us thinking differently about schools. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were besieged by people saying there are too few teachers in Kansas. Kansans teachers are leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still a problem? Well, there are too few teachers in Kansas. Same would be true in Utah and New Jersey. We have too few teachers in the United States. But let's dispel a myth. There was a billboard uh, up on I-70 said, come to Missouri and teach, and that prompted a discussion that everyone was leaving to go to Missouri. We actually import uh, from our surrounding states more than we export. Uh, in some cases, a great deal more import. So we still need more people to want to become teachers. And, uh, Michael, I have an application later on. If you'd <laughs> like to renew that Missouri license, we transfer you that over You think so? To you think I'm ready? <laughs> uh, there must be a, a website somewhere that has all this kind of information about the department. Yes, uh, you can go to ksde.org, and uh, there's everything you would need to know. Okay, leave the application and come back and see us some other time. <laughs> okay. all right? Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. That is Kansas Education Commissioner, Dr. Randy Watson. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. John Stevens is head of Rock Hill Strategic. Attorney Laura McConwell is a former mayor of Mission, Kansas. Lisa Johnston is a columnist and consultant. Crosby Kemper III is the director of the Kansas City Library System and host of KCPT's Meet the Past and Centropolis programs. It's a good looking group. Your host not included in that. Uh, anyway, good to have all of you. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for having Thank us. You. While there is still a threat of more lawsuits from Democratic lawyers, it now appears Greg Orman will be on the November ballot in Kansas. Orman, an independent, is thought to be a major gubernatorial candidate, along with Democratic nominee Laura Kelly and GOP hopeful Chris Kobach. Some Democratic attorneys challenged Orman's petition to be on the ballot, saying many of the signatures were invalid. Orman fought back, saying while some Democrats claimed to be for fair elections, they used frivolous complaints to disenfranchise his supporters. So the key question seems to be this, are Democrats really concerned about Orman's presence on the ballot? And if so, why? And let's start with Lisa. They're absolutely concerned. And the primary reason is because this election is likely to come down to both moderate Republicans who are disenchanted with Kobach as well as registered unaffiliated <coughs> voters. And the Democrats would much prefer that this be a forced choice situation between Laura Kelly and Chris Kobach. Now with Orman in the mix, it really could go any way. It's really going to be interesting to watch how this unfolds. But the interesting thing that happened a few weeks ago is that a poll came out in which there were head-to-head -head matchups, Orman and Kobach and Laura Kelly and Kobach. And the polling showed that Orman had a significant advantage in a head-to-head -head matchup. He was ahead 13 points, whereas Laura Kelly was only ahead by a tenth of a point. And what that seems to suggest is that there's a block of voters out there that are disenchanted with Kobach, but may be reluctant to pull the lever for a Democrat. And so Orman may pull some of those votes that Laura Kelly would ultimately like to convert to vote for her. So they're very concerned. Crosby, there seems to be some Republican defections from Kobach. Steve Bacchus, who was the chairman of the Jeff Collier campaign, <laughs> is now the co-chairman of the Orman campaign. Do you think he's uh, at so, the beginning of a, a long trek of Republicans? So, so I, you know, Greg did pretty well the last time out <laughs> statewide, and uh, he's a very good guy, friend, friend of mine. We've had him in the library. Uh, I, he's a man on a mission. But Kansans care about issues. And if you look at his website, you look at the eight reasons to vote for Greg Orman, not one of them has to do with an issue that's important to Kansans. The first one is about how he will listen to the feelings of Kansans. It sounds, it's, you know, it sounds like a pop song from the 70s. And at the end of the day, this is going to come down to be a fairly traditional race. Uh, I think the Democratic nominee is a good nominee, and I think Chris Kobach has got a lot of... Uh, 
uh, baggage from uh, having overhyped uh, 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 voter fraud and, and immigration issues uh, that uh, go against a, 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 an essential moderation in Kansas po politics. On the other hand, I think Laura Kelly is, she's got a problem that's going to happen because of Sharice Davids, um, who the third district in Johnson County, which is the biggest vote in the state of Kansas, um, is now facing an interesting race, but one that the Democrats have just lost. And Cherise is running against Kevin Yoder, the incumbent right. third district and, congressman. And, and, she, she, and, and she, she supposedly has said she would like to abandon ICE, abolish immigration ICE, and, 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 and then enforcement. And then she denied she said it. She yeah. lied about saying it. But you hear the audio. And, and, both, and both, both things have hurt her and made her, you know, a... a outside the mainstream candidate, and I think the Democrats in general in Kansas are going to be tagged with that. They had a chance. I think they may have lost it because of the nomination. I, I was days. looking at Real Clear Politics a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. and it shows the Kansas gubernatorial race is a toss-up. And that's kind of surprising in Kansas, one of the most Republican states traditionally in the Union. Yeah. Well, I, I, th I think it shows, uh, I, I think it shows Kobox, um, Overall unpopularity among a lot of moderate Democrats or moderate Republicans and and those in the in the middle uh, that that have seen some of the problems in the fights with the legislature over eight years previously, and uh, I think a lot of people just don't want to return to this caustic Topeka battles uh, and a race to the bottom with a lot of issues that uh, that we face in Kansas. You think Republicans are going to defect from Kobach? Well, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see uh, who votes in the the mm -hmm. Democrat. I mean, the governor's race. Uh, I, there are issues with Chris, and, <coughs> and 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 Chris is running his campaign based on federal issues and mm -hmm. not Kansas issues. Right. I mean, if you look yes. at all the things he sends out, he wants to talk about and the president. He I wants agree. to talk yeah. about the immigration. He wants to talk about federal things that he doesn't have any control mm -hmm. over. I don't think that that clears a path for either Greg Orman or Laura Kelly but, to win. But, but he will figure it out, and there are two issues in Kansas, taxes and education. Yeah. If it comes down to taxes, Kobach wins. Yeah. If it comes down to education, I think Laura Kelly wins. He has some strong messaging, and he's a very effective political communicator, although he I don't is. happen to agree yeah. with him on a lot right. of things. But, And he has the advantage of the fact that the majority of registered voters in Kansas are Republican. Right. And so uh, even absolutely. though some people have a distaste uh, for yeah, him. Yeah. I remember in the second Brownback election, people were saying he has no chance, he's <laughs> going to lose. Right. And then he won, and, mm -hmm. and the yeah. argument was Kansas muscle memory. That's well, why yes. people are just <laughs> oh, accustomed absolutely. to voting. There's truth to that. Voting There's, there is truth to that. John's yeah. right. They're going to yeah. want a governor that's going to work with the legislature, and I'm not <clears> sure that I don't know that Chris is demonstrating oh, he'd do that. We're running behind, so we've got to move forward here. As his months as mayor dwindle down to fewer than 12, Sly James continues to push a crowded agenda. He announced plans for a pre-K sales tax to be on the November ballot, but strong opposition from school district interests and city council members forced him to back off until at least next April. And if that weren't enough, James wants programs to combat race and inequality issues and make inroads on the city's unfunded pension liabilities of only $811 million. Noble though these goals may be, what are the chances of accomplishing any of them, Crosby? Well, I think the, the, the racial issue is maybe un, underlying the most important issue, but I think it's something the, the mayor hasn't, it's the one thing the mayor hasn't done terribly well. He's a great ambassador for the city, but this part of it, he's not been a great ambassador to the east side. I think there's, there's relatively little interest on the east side in <coughs> working with him on this. So I, 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 my guess is that's the one that will fall by the wayside. We do need to solve the problem with the pension plan, Absolutely. but he's asked Herb Kahn, who thought we'd solved it before with his commission to do <laughs> he, this. He heads every commission he, that the exactly, city appoints. Exactly, including the pre-K commission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think he's overworked. Where, where are you on pre-K, by the way? Do you think so, it's a good so idea? So I was on the commission, the mayor's first. I was yeah. one of his uh, appointments to the, co the commission representing the library, and the library's had a, a representative, Crystal Ferris, on it ever since uh, as well. The city doesn't have responsibility or a charter to do this. And that's one of the reasons the superintendents are unhappy about this. We need to do something with pre-K. We also ha already have an expensive and extensive pre-K program in Kansas City. It's called Head Start. Mm 
run by mm -hmm. Mark, yeah. who the mayor's been working with. America Regional yeah, Council. We've never actually analyzed that. It would seem to me, number one, I, I, and I said this on the commission a number of times, let's look at what Head Start's doing first yeah. and foremost. Let's do something that's experimental and small scale to see how it works, mm -hmm. uh, sec secondly, and then let's, let's spend the really well, big well, money. John, uh, Mayor James is an ex-official member of the police board. Yeah. Homicides are happening with alarming regularity. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't he be devoting some time to that problem? Well, I, I think absolutely. And, and I've been very outspoken in saying that I, I still think we should have a conversation about local control of the police department uh, being the last city in America with state-controlled uh, police board. And uh, I, I also think that um, I don't know about effectiveness of taking on a lot of these issues with Mayor James in his, in his, in his last few months. However, I do think that his best, his, his best role over his last few months in office is to be a convener of these discussions and to elevate these issues in, in the discussion and honestly to really force and compel the many mayoral candidates that are out there to address these issues and take on these issues. Laura, not that you'd have any experience with this, but is it more <laughs> difficult for mayors to wield influence as their term draws to a close? Well, I think so because you're, you're going to start losing staff because staff knows that there's You weren't term limited though, were you? I was not term limited, no. no. <laughs> I could have kept continued to run. But, you know, with staff, staff has knows somebody new is coming in that they're going to have to appease. I, I agree with John. I mean, I think it's important <coughs> for the mayor to raise these issues because I think okay. the candidates need to address them. And in, in Crosby's right, we need Kansas City needs to have those conversations. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and it's... It, and we, 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 we avoided the fact that Kansas City's got one of the highest violent crime rates in the United mm. States, mm -hmm. and we have the highest crime rate against African Americans as victims, not yep. as, as committing crimes, but as victims. The highest rate, seven of the last 13 years, including last year. Yeah. If black lives matter, and they surely do in this community, we need to get on this, and the civic community needs to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I know you pay a lot of attention to education, know a lot about it. Uh, where do you fall on this pre-K question? Is pre-K Valuable? I think it can be valuable. The key is you need to ensure that you have a high quality program, and mm -hmm. that's part of the problem here. It's just a general vision, but we don't have any details. I think what Crosby said has a lot of merit. Evaluate what's being done, see what's successful, what isn't, develop uh, a concept for what we need to go do going forward and sell it to the voters in terms of this is why we feel this would be a high quality experience but certainly pre-k can help kids to get off to a great start mm -hmm. and to have better achievement once they get into school. Crosby, is there any expectation City Hall can impact issues of race and inequity? Um, I think it, I think leadership can always ha have an impact, and we can certainly do something with crime. We know that yeah. there, you know, some of the candidates for mayor are saying poverty is the cause of crime, and certainly that's that's a truth. But it's also true that some of the cities with the highest poverty rates have lower crime rates right. than we do. So there, we can fight crime, and so the, the mayor can do something about that, and that's a, a, a racial issue. Well, well, I was going to say, and that's also by con by convening the stakeholders mm -hmm. and the people in those communities to talk about. And, you know, there, those, everybody needs to be part of that solution, and it's mm -hmm. not, it's not the city hall doing it and being magnanimous for the population. You need to get that constituency involved and engaged. On, because they want a safe school. Well, Kids can't study if they're worried right. about getting shot. So safe schools are important. The eviction rate we have, mm -hmm. the water rate, the yep. water problems, water and sewer rates that we have. Um, there, there are all kinds of problems that affect race. The, the problems that have built up over a long over number decades. of years and, and, and not, not easy solved, to resolve. But you've got to start time. talking about them and, and as a city yeah. dealing with them. All right, we've got to move ahead. Kansas City Star columnist and frequent ruckus panelist Steve Rose is worried about something every week. <laughs> and that is what Gosh. makes it possible for him to write a column every weekend. Last weekend's worry, the future of the United States of America. Steve believes only people in their 60s and older are paying attention to the news. Most others are unaware of the multiple controversies now afoot in the Trump administration. Few, he says, recognize the name Stormy Daniels, I know John does, or Michael <laughs> Avenatti. Fewer still are aware of the president's comments about fake news and the media. Rose claims he now senses what it must have been like to live in an autocratic country where few knew or cared. 
And he adds, I feel it in the pit of my stomach with this massive disengagement. It can happen here too. So John, mm -hmm. I know you know about Stormy Daniels, but, but do you take Steve's point on this seriously or does he need to cool out? Well, Stormy, Sh Stormy Shannon, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I think he makes he makes a good point because there there are concerns about apathy of messaging, <clears throat> the negativity of messaging, just the out and out lies that are out there that are being stated and repeated as fact. However, I think he misses a key point, and I think stating that only people 60 and older. Uh, are really engaged in this, I, I, I fundamentally think he's wrong. I think we have a new generation of young people coming of age in this country that are engaged like, like never before. Now it's how do you transfer that engagement from just Twitter to the polling booth? And that's what I think everyone's trying to figure out, and I think they're getting there. Um, I, I, I tend to think he's overstating it, but I think it's a conversation that's worth having. Laura, same question to you. Uh, do you buy Steve's viewpoint, or do you think he needs to chill out for a while? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't feel that there's the doom and gloom and the sky is falling. I have more faith in our country and the electorate than that, but I do recognize that there are some folks that are choosing to check out because they're in an information overload. I also think that there is a young generation that is very interested in the political mm -hmm. process. They're just engaging in it a little differently than the 60 and over crowd yeah. because of the way that they communicate and the issues that they're involved in. Um, and, and, I, and I think that, but, but I think with Twitter and Instagram and all those other things that allows people to sort of be snapping turtles, meaning they can sit at home, be alone and, and complain mm -hmm. rather than get together and have some of that hand-to-hand -hand combat, so to speak, which I think is vital for a political process. Uh, but, but Lisa, doesn't this fly in the face of what analysts are saying? Uh, uh, new people are registering to vote. There might be a blue wave because of all these new <laughs> young people, young Democrats, ready to overturn the Trump control of the Senate and the House. All the families that can't have dinner together because of the fighting between relatives over politics. Does, doesn't this column seem to be out of touch with those developments? Well, I agree with Steve in large part. Now, I think what you're saying certainly has merit. Now, whether some of these trends translate into what we see at the voting booth, that remains to be seen. We'll see in November. Uh, but I do think that a lot of people are getting disengaged and exhausted with some of the news coverage, particularly the fact that a lot of the cable news stations have turned into TMZ for politics. It's all about the latest snarky tweet and who said what to who and who is mad at who, and it's not really news. Now, you know, Steve in his column, I do take issue with the fact that he says that people don't know and don't care. Yeah. I think that they care, but many of them don't know because they aren't really getting informed. They stay in silos. They watch one news channel, maybe a limited number of shows, and they're not really civically engaged in the that's way they need to. We've got to wrap this up. Though. Uh, yeah. Crosby, are, are today's political battles, the turmoil worse than in other periods of our history? I think it goes up and down. Yeah. The intensity I mean, level is very high right now, but it's not any higher the Vietnam than it was in the 60s. Right. Yeah. Vietnam, Vietnam, right. Civil, right. Civil the 1960s. War, so, the Vietnam. Yeah. And, you know, Steve himself is an example of what he, what he says. You know, Patrick Tui said to him uh, at one point on this program, I believe that all the research on TIF and tax abatement uh, showed that it, that it didn't work. And Steve said, was, Steve's reply was, I don't care about the facts. I don't care about research. <laughs> well, and also, I think the fights of the family and it, it aren't necessarily policy discussions. It's personality issues. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to stop it. We're out of time. <laughs> time to head now for this, uh, out of time for this discussion. We have time okay. for going to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckets have 30 seconds each to analyze, compromise, or theorize. And we start with Crosby, who will do all of the above. So uh, in 2009, uh, John McCain gave uh, a powerful, passionate speech against torture in the United States Senate and assaulted two presidents, uh, George Bush for inaugurating the torture and uh, Barack Obama for covering it up, not releasing the information about it and continuing some parts of it. Uh, it's a sign of uh, a great hero that uh, John McCain was, that that was a principled uh, speech on, based on his experience and that at his funeral, he invited Barack Obama and George Bush mm -hmm. to deliver the, the eulogy. I, I've got to make up for something I forgot. The next Wednesday, September the 5th at 7 o'clock, there will be a debate on KCPT featuring candidates for the governor's position in Kansas. Next Wednesday, 7 o'clock. 
So I guess I'm going to uh, roast the electorate because I want the electorate to look when they're at the voting booths to vote for the person and the entity that they want to be in that position and be that statesman and be that advocate. There's just a real divide between what people seem to want in a candidate versus what they want actually in their elected official and public servant. And I think we need to get that divide okay. closed. Lisa? My roast is for those in the Democratic Party who are spending a great deal of time and effort trying to keep Greg Orman from running as an independent candidate for governor. This sends the message mm -hmm. that they don't feel confident that they can compete and win with him in the race and ironically helps Orman by giving him a great deal of publicity. If those in the Democratic Party feel that Laura Kelly is the best choice for governor, then they need to make that case to the voters instead of spending time fighting Orman. Okay, John. I'd like to toast the Kansas City Star editorial board for their August 29th column on transportation in Kansas City. Uh, for too long, Kansas City has pitted cars against pedestrians, bi bikes against buses, buses against streetcars. I think a comprehensive, holistic approach to how we, how we move people of all types and all backgrounds uh, through Kansas City is vitally important and a conversation worth having. And let me mention once again, uh, next Wednesday, September the 5th, Kansas Governor's Debate, 7 o'clock here on KCPT. And that, unfortunately, is all the time we have for Ruckus this week. We are off next week, back on September the 13th at 7. Now for the Ruckets of the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.